Sometimes we forget that the church isn't a mere institution like any other. The church is the body of the resurrected Christ in which death is conquered. Christos Yanaris emphasizes that we must always keep in mind the true nature of the church, especially when engaging in ecumenical dialogue with other Christian traditions. The ecumenism of the 20th century was mostly focused on dialogue and allowing different historically alienated confessions and traditions to get to know each other. But this sort of superficial dialogue will never align with the eschatological, incarnational, and Eucharistic nature of the church. This sort of ecumenism lowers the church to the level of a worldly institution focused on worldly problems like feminism, human rights, the third world, and all the other practical and political issues we face in the modern world. But the church is not of the world. The church has conquered the world in Christ. There are so many different ways of resolving the problems of the third world or contemporary women's issues, but there's only one promise to truly conquer death, the church. Worldly institutions can help to foster liberty and promote education, but true freedom and true knowledge are found only in the church. The type of freedom the church provides has nothing to do with neoliberal freedom or freedom of choice. As Byung-Chul Han points out, this freedom to choose and enjoy often perpetuates even more pervasive forms of domination. Neoliberal freedom is the freedom of the supermarket, the ability to choose between a multitude of different things to consume. And while this freedom may be nice, it's not the primary interest of Yanaris. The freedom that interests me is the one which frees us from the constraints of the created world. This is the freedom that Peter was given when he walked on water alongside and through the power of Christ. In this moment, it became clear that Peter receives his existence only in and through his relationship with his Lord. This ability to live in a relational mode of being with the transcendent creator is what the church provides. Relation or communion with the Almighty is true freedom freedom. For Yanaris, the free person is constituted by its relations. The person is found in the freedom of immediate and existential relation with its creator. The process of entering into relation or gaining one's freedom is an ascetic struggle, one which is only possible in the church where God condescends to the level of man. This ascetic struggle is a struggle for freedom, of liberation from self-enclosure within the ego and the passions in order to enter into relation with God. The second thing only the church provides is true knowledge. This knowledge is not mere information, which is, as Byung-Chul Han also notes, ultimately devoid of true knowledge as it's simply a repetition of the same. True knowledge involves self-transcendence, personal knowledge of the creator of all things, a communion with something other than our own selves, indeed something other to and beyond our own nature. Knowledge can never be separated from freedom because freedom involves the movement out of what Byung-Chul Han calls the inferno of the same. It involves an exit from the monotonous circle of the ego and an entrance into the freedom of a true encounter with the other. This is self-transcendence as opposed to self-imprisonment. But this self-transcendence is necessarily an ascetic struggle, a self-renunciation in which we reject any mode of being defined by self relation and self-absorption. This is the only way to achieve freedom, freedom as love and freedom as knowledge. This is why the path to knowledge and freedom and love is the path of ascetic struggle. It is in this way that we free ourselves from the ex from the exigent from the exigent from the exigent exigency from the ex exigencies exigencies from the exit exigent exit exigencies exigencies of the ego. To know the other, it is necessary to say goodbye to oneself. There are two ways to actually engage in this ascetic struggle at a practical level, the service of men 
or monasticism. Most of us aren't going to become monastics, so as Christians we should focus on blessing others and living for the sake of others. But Christian love of one's neighbor doesn't involve an abolition of the distance and distinction between people. The Christian is separated from others in order to be united with them. We love at an appropriate distance until the time when Christ will unify us all perfectly. Modern society precludes both distance and unity as it absolutizes the individual and collectivizes at the same time. It destroys distance through things like social media, which has the paradoxical effect of alienating people from each other even more. This is something that Byung-Chul Han has also talked about at length. Today's communication does not allow us to say you to appeal to the other. The appeal to the other as you presupposes a primal distance. Digital communication in particular is designed to eliminate all distance. Today, by means of digital media, we seek to bring the other as close as possible. This does not give us more of the other, rather it causes them to disappear. To exist is to renounce the world and open oneself to the other. True freedom is found only in the church because only in the church do we truly experience the presence of God. This type of genuine openness to the other, as opposed to superficial dialogue and meetings, is what's necessary for true ecumenism. And in the same way that opening oneself to God begins with a confession of sins and repentance, true ecumenism must begin in the same way. I dream of an ecumenism which will begin with a confession of sins on the part of each church. If we begin with this confession of our historic sins, perhaps we can manage to give ourselves to each other in the end. We are full of faults, full of weaknesses which distort our human nature. But St. Paul says that from our weakness can be born a life which will triumph over death. I dream of an ecumenism that begins with the voluntary acceptance of that weakness. According to Yanaris, in order to move towards a Christian unity that isn't superficial or forced, we need to learn how to distinguish what is real from what is merely psychological. And by psychology, he's not referring to the scientific field, but to the psychological illusions and the ideologies that we create. While he doesn't give any specific examples, I assume he's referring to the illusions of our own righteousness, of the intrinsic evil of the other, and all of these ideological traps which keeps us from genuinely encountering the other in its otherness. Distinguishing between what's real and what's merely psychological is perhaps the most difficult thing we must do, but it's possible to do in the church, the pillar and ground of the truth.